H1 transpose and what is H2 transpose? You can see that actually the operation of back projection that we noted before is take the values of G1, G2, G3, G4, which is the first projection. Remember you, the, the draw that I have done. You have to take these values and put them here. And then you take these values and put them here and do addition. This is exactly what is going to be done. Uh, I can show you it, it in, uh, in, in design, how this can be done. So this H1 transpose G, if you look at all the details of these matrices and do the transposition and do the operation, you will see that the operation of back projection would be take these four values, put it here, put it here, put it here, and put it here. Expand it. And again, take these values, put it here, put it here, expand it in this direction, and then make superposition. This will be the operation of back projection. So let us uh, show this and summarize a little this with these uh, uh, transparencies. So you remember that we started by three examples. The first example was a thermometer. We talked about convolution and the convolution. This was the simulation of a thermometer. We talked about uh, image restoration, original image, observed image, two-dimensional convolution. These are the examples of this problem. We talked about imaging, different imaging systems. And we talked just today, we talked about this Radon transform written in two different forms, as you can see here. And uh, uh, this is the case of 2D and 3D. We discussed it before. Uh, this was an example of analogy between computer tomography and computer vision. Uh, this was the case of microwave imaging in place of X-rays if we had microwaves. And this was the relation of Fourier inverse problem. <coughs> uh, these relations uh, here in the tape on the on the board I noted here omega x and omega y, but sometimes also it is noted u and v. So this is uh, an optical imaging problem. This is uh, what I called uh, uh, slice projection theorem and the Fourier synthesis in the full in in, in X-ray tomography. This is a projection. Its Fourier transform gives you the values here, and as just I showed, you have the values for one angle second angle and, and so on. You have the values of the Fourier transform. And the inverse problem is from this partial knowledge, because you do not know the values at all these points, you know the values only on these lines, from this partial knowledge of G, you want to make the image. From this partial knowledge, which are here, you want to obtain this image, which is here. So this is the Fourier synthesis inverse problem. And as I told you, if in place of X-rays we take the uh, microwave imaging, uh, we would obtain the same uh, uh, relations, but on semicircles. And uh, so again, the inverse problem here becomes we know the values on these semicircles for different angles, and we want to go back here. So the equation writes exactly the same. The only things which is different is that the values of G are observed on this semicircle. And as I told you, this is a comparison of different other applications, X-ray tomography, Diffraction tomography, microwave. I showed you well, that was in other direction, but it doesn't matter. It's the same. This is the SAR imaging. 
And there are other techniques of imaging, for example, eddy, eddy current imaging, which is used in non-destructive testing application. Uh, also, uh, you can find this Fourier synthesis problem. And just I can uh, mention you that this Fourier synthesis problem was the subject of my uh, uh, post-PhD uh, thesis that I have finished in 1987. Uh, so that's <laughs> just to, to mention it. Uh, so this is, this inverse problems of free synthesis arises in many different applications. Uh, we mentioned this, let me go farther. Uh, somebody uh, told me that there was an, a small error here, the, the X and Y, I corrected this. Somebody, I don't know if she's there. Anyway, uh, so uh, we summarize uh, the equations which are here. All can be written. This is the Fourier synthesis problem. This is the computed tomography X-ray, Radon transform, Fourier transform, convolution, two-dimensional convolution, one-dimensional convolution. All of these can be written in this general form. And uh, again, a still more general form is here. This is the linear form. This is the convolution. We have discrete data. From this discrete data, we know that from any finite number of discrete data, we cannot find uniquely a solution for this inverse problem. So the problem is always ill-posed if we have finite data. <coughs> If we had theoretically, mathematically, if, uh, if we had infinite number of the data, then the problem was not the case. In some cases, the problem can be well posed. But in general, very often in engineering, not in mathematics, in engineering, we have always finite number of the data. Nothing is infinite in, in, in practice. So if you have finite number of the data, from a finite number of the data, you cannot find uniquely this function. So the problem is always ill-posed. And uh, yeah, uh, let me, yeah, here we talked about Radon transform. And it's, uh, yeah, I think that uh, Somewhere I have written 1 over 4p. This, this is the, the proper expression. This constant value is not very important, but this is the proper expression. Uh, we uh, define the different uh, operation of derivation, Hilbert transform, back projection. I wrote here again this relation. The operation of back, uh, the operation of uh, derivation and Hilbert transform. Derivation and Hilbert transform. We can do it in the Fourier domain. We can go in the Fourier domain, do filtering, go back in the Fourier domain, and do back projection. So from the data, we go in the Fourier domain, we do filtering, we go back in the space domain, we do back projection. All this operation is called filtering in general. And uh, this is just an example to show you that this method works. This is an image from which I have computed these different projections at different angles. Here I have taken 64 projections. This image is a, an image of 125 to 125 pixels. I had 64 projections. For each projection, I had 128 samples. So I have less data that unknown. But still, if I do back projection, the filtered back projection, the result is no bad. It, it is almost the same that here. But not exactly because the number of the projection is not enough. I had to take more projections to obtain this. If the number of projections reduces, then the result is, becomes really bad. And if still, not only the number of projections is limited, but also the angle is limited, 
you cannot go all around the object but only half turn then uh, the results will not be good in these methods there are some limits and let me uh, yeah okay okay so we arrive now at uh, at the, the steps that we try to we saw that uh, we have different inverse problems so I'm not going to give you more details in different inverse problems but mainly we are going to work with this linear inverse problem which is here and no we are going to to define different great classes of the methods I decided uh, to divide these methods in three categories analytical methods, algebraic methods, and probabilistic methods that we will discuss a little later. The first, uh, the first uh, category of the methods is analytical methods. Uh, what is the main concept of these analytical methods? If in these analytical methods uh, these analytical methods are very often developed in mathematics departments. In mathematics departments, they do not assume that the number of the data is limited. They assume that they know the value of G for each S. In mathematics, everything is possible. <laughs> in reality, not always is possible. But in mathematics, if you assume that you know G of S everywhere, and if you know that G depends on F in a linear way, you may decide, many mathematics mathematicians do that, okay, I know that this relation is linear, so I am going to define a solution for the problem which depends linearly on the data. And what is the linear relation that I can write? The linear relation between the solution that I am looking and the data and the main objective is to find this operation. This operation must be in, in, uh, in fact must be the inverse of this operation. Okay? So the mathematician, they try to obtain the expression of W as a function of H. Okay? So this is the main technique of analytical methods. And how, how, to, how they obtain W? In general, they define a criterion which is very often a quadratic distance. Very often the mathematician, they work in Hilbert space or uh, there are also many more sophisticated spaces, but very often it is in the Hilbert space. So they define the difference between G and this output. And this is the criterion because F hat depends on W. Then they minimize this criterion to obtain the expression of W. One of the examples, which is uh, one of mathematician they found, if h, if this function which is here, is this particular function which is the Fourier transform, Fourier did exactly the same approach and he obtained that the solution of w is just uh, exponential of g this. And this is the expression that Fourier found. And because he found this expression, he gave his name to this expression. And actually, in the mathematics departments, many people have started to look at these inverse problems for particular cases, for particular expressions for H. Fourier expression is this. But there are many others. Radon found an expression for the inverse because for the case of Radon this expression was very particular okay was the delta function but there are many other people who worked for the different cases with different expression here 
Hilbert, Weil, Mellon, you can find a list of many mathematicians who were interested in this integral equation with a specific function h and they tried to obtain a solution uh, uh, for that and when they found the solution and they proved the theorem they gave their name to this uh, uh, transformation okay so this is the the, the technique so this uh, this uh, uh, exactly the example that we showed was the, the radon transform radon interested in this function which was a particular function which is which shows the integration over online and he showed that the solution would be in this form but uh, as I told you these analytical methods as you can see these analytical methods they give just the expression in mathematical form but when we want to apply them in real application we want to do numerical computation we have to do numerical derivation we have to do all these operations in the numeric and as I told you even if this equation was known for a long time when the people were, went in the Fourier domain and found these kind of the relations they used uh, these methods for, uh, for real applications. So this filtering, we can implement it very easily by MATLAB. And this back projection is, is easy also to implement it. But uh, as uh, just I showed here, these uh, analytical methods have limits. And one of the limits is that if the conditions, if the mathematical conditions for the theorem is not verified, these methods cannot work. This is normal. For example, if the number of the projections is limited, this, has ha this happens very often in practical applications. Or if the angles are limited, these analytical methods cannot give satisfactory results. And this is normal, that cannot give satisfactory results because we do not satisfy all the conditions of the theorems. All the mathematical conditions of the theorem. Because in the theorem, he says that if I know the value of G for all angles and all R, but all angles, it is not possible. The angles goes by one degree, two degree, and so on. It is not a continuous function. And all R, it is not possible to do also in all R because the detectors are placed in discrete positions. So you do not have, you have from here to here and a finite number and you do not have the values outside of the, of the detectors. So we do not know G for all R and not for all phi. If we could, you could have them, then okay, this equation is good. But if it is not the case, this equation, the numerical implementation of this equation, become more difficult. So, uh, so the analytical methods have these limits. The second approach that I mentioned is the parametric methods. In the parametric methods, which is very, very uh, well known in many applications and many engineers, they do, they use these parametric methods. The main idea is that the function f is assumed to be described by a finite number, by a very few number of parameters. So you are not going to find a function. This function is defined by a finite number of the parameters. If you know the parameters, you know the function. So the problem is no more estimating f directly, but estimating the parameters. When the parameter is known, you can compute f. And then, so this problem this parametric modeling of the unknown 
transforms the problem to the ill posed problem to a well posed problem. Because you are, you are writing this infinite dimensional function with a finite dimensional parameter. And then, and then what? One of the most famous techniques since Newton, since a very long time, is to define a criterion which is the least square criterion. And the least squared criterion is just sum over all the observed value of the difference between the observations, the measured data, and the output of the model. Okay? This is the output of the model, this is the observation, this is the difference, difference power 2, sum over all the observations. This is the least square criterion. And then you minimize, you optimize this criterion, you obtain theta hat. When you obtain theta hat, you have f hat, which is defined by this limited number of parameters. Uh, this least square criterion has also some advantage and some uh, drawbacks. The advantage is that uh, it is easy to understand. It is, many people have used it before. But uh, one of the drawbacks of this least square is that sometimes, not always, sometimes if there is some uh, uh, outlier in the data. If there is one of these data is too far, just for some reason, one of the detectors didn't work. If there is some outlier here, this outlier will change completely the results. If so, uh, sometimes the people have defined uh, what is called a robust criteria, where in place of this function, which is power two. They took other functions, phi, power 1, L1, or Huber, which is a, a quadratic first and then a linear function. So there has been many functions who has been defined to be, to pretend to be robust. And uh, so you, you can, the, the examples are L1, this is L2. L1, Huber, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of literature on that. And finally, uh, we have also the probabilistic methods, which says about likelihood. Likelihood is the probability of g given theta, and maximum likelihood estimation is the value of theta which maximizes, uh, which in this case because I have put here minus. Uh, min minimizes the likelihood, uh, maximizes the likelihood, but uh, uh, yeah, probably I have to, uh, to eliminate this uh, minus here. And uh, we, we will talk a little later about the probabilistic method about penalized likelihood. But uh, a few examples, a few examples in, 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 uh, in spectrometry. In spectrometry, you know that the time series signals that you are looking for is the spectra. And what is the spectra? A spectra is a function which is zero, sometimes a peak, again zero, sometimes another peak, again zero, sometimes another peak. Any of these peaks, if you, if you uh, model each of the peaks by just a Gaussian shape, so you have, say, k peak, k spectra. You can define each of these spectra by their position, their width, and their amplitude. So in place of finding a function of t, no, you have a function you in, in, define, in place of defining a function of t for all t. You need only to estimate the coefficients, the positions, the widths, and the amplitudes. So this is the, the parameters theta. Okay. So uh, this method has been used in, in many uh, chemical uh, signal processing. 
uh, in particular in spectrometry. And so the problem is just estimate the positions, the widths, and the amplitude of all the peaks. In tomography, the examples that we, we, we talked about, if, uh, if you are in non-destructive testing, you are trying to see inside of a section of the engine of uh, a, a car, for example. You know that in this section of the engine, everywhere is metal, and there are just the holes. And the object of non-destructive testing application is just to meet